Unfortunately, a lot of the testing tools, they're amazing, but they all work with the DOM. If you ask them, is this text present on the screen? They're not looking on the screen. They're looking on the DOM to see if that text is in the DOM. And it's going to say, yes, it's there. Well, I've seen quite a few cases where the text is maybe same color as the background. So you can't even see it or it's bleeding off the edge of the page. It's hidden by some other element that's overlapping it. It's upside down. It's whatever. Like there's a million things that can go wrong. Big thanks to our partners, Linode Fastly and LaunchDarkly. We love Leno. They keep it fast and simple. Check them out at leno.com slash changelog. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com and get your feature flags powered by LaunchDarkly. Get a demo at launchdarkly.com. What's up, JS Party people? Have you ever wondered if you could be offering a faster, less buggy experience for your customers? Well, with Raygun Air and Performance Monitoring, you have all the information you need at your fingertips to quickly find and fix errors and performance issues across your tech stack down to the line of code. This saves you time, this saves you money, and this saves your sanity. Head to raygun.com to join thousands of customer-centric software teams who use Raygun every single day. Again, raygun.com to give them a try with a free 14-day trial. This is JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. We record live on YouTube each and every Thursday at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. Subscribe to our channel for notifications at youtube.com slash changelog. And join in the conversation on Twitter. We are at JSPartyFM. Okay, let's get right into it. Hey, it's party time, y'all. Party people, long time no talk. I am super excited for today's episode because today we are joined by the wonderful Angie Jones, who is absolutely notorious for her amazing work with testing. And I'm thrilled to be talking to you today, Angie. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. No complaints here. We also are joined by Nick Nisi. Nick, how are you? Hey, hoy hoy. I'm glad to be here <laughs> and uh, really excited to meet you, Angie, and uh, excited to talk about some testing. Yes, absolutely cool. So let's kick things off by, I- I- Angie, if you could just give us a little overview to yourself and your experience with testing and a little bit about Test Automation University, that would be fabulous. All right. So I am a principal automation architect and I've been doing development and testing forever, quite a long time at this point. I've had roles, most of my roles have been very specific automation, test automation roles, where I come in and I help teams to build up their, you know, testing process and strategy and the actual framework and teach them how to test their code or whatever. So I've done this like full time at several companies such as IBM and Twitter, LexisNexis, also consulted with quite a few companies as well. So your Amazons and Disney and, you know, a lot of big kind of enterprise companies travel all over the globe when the world is open, it's opening back up. So I do have a few gigs coming up, but yeah, I travel and do workshops at companies and essentially teach people how to build better quality code. That's wonderful. It's so funny when I hear anyone ask about testing, I'm like, Angie, that's Angie is like the expert in testing. So I'm thrilled that you could join us. So you mentioned that you primarily do test automation. And I'm curious, why would we want to automate tests? Why don't we just, you know, do them manually every single time? Mm -hmm. So testing is something that's not regularly taught in curriculums, right? So it doesn't even matter what route you took. If you went university, boot camp, self-talk, whatever. Nobody's really talking about how do you test your code. So it's something that a lot of newer developers don't really understand how to do or why to do, right? So just like you asked that question, I get that a lot of people are like, why would I spend time like automating this? That's going to take me forever. I wrote my feature 
I click the button, I see that it works, and I'm good to go. People don't really understand the why of this until later when they've been bitten, right? So the why is because unless you're just, that was it and you're never touching this code base again, there's going to be some regression. You're going to add more to it. You're going to refactor stuff. You're going to delete stuff. You're going to, you know, do a lot of different things with your application. And that one thing that you tested last month, you know, may be affected by something new that you've added today. And you don't know that because you're only manually testing what you added to date. So you automate this so that you have a regression, a suite of regression tests that you can run and make sure like, okay, when I added this and I thought that it didn't touch anything else, I can be sure of that because my test will say, no, girl, it actually breaks this other thing over here. And so, you know, it kind of saves your butt. Not kind of. It definitely saves your butt. It also gives you a lot of confidence to be able to refactor your code if needed because you know your tests have your back. So this is essentially a capture of what your application is supposed to do, kind of like documentation, if you will, that is your source of truth. So you can go in and you can confidently change things and refactor and add new features, run those tests, and you're like, good to go, you know? Without that, I always see people very hesitant and scared. You've all been there, I'm sure, where there's certain areas of the code base. If you got to touch it, you're like, Hail Mary three times right? <laughs> before you do it. Well, you don't have to do that if you have some tests in place. Go for it. And your test will let you know if it still works. That's so funny because Angie and I both worked at IBM and it was my very first job. And I remember it was probably like my second week on the job, straight out of computer science degree. I didn't know what I was doing, but I thought I did. And I pushed, you know, to the main branch and I broke everyone's dev environment. And I got a very angry call from a very angry Scottish man who said, well, do you not know how to run tests? Did you write any tests? And I was like, what do you mean? What is testing? I've never learned about this. And ever since that day, I'm like, okay, I got to (laughs) learn. You know, very similar situation for me too. And I think that the fact that it's not really taught in like traditional computer science degrees or things like that it like got built up as this big thing to tackle in my head. And so there was just this mental obstacle to overcome before I could even really write tests because it was like, how do I even do that? Am I testing the right (laughs) thing? Like what testing framework should I use? And of course I started with Java. So it was his J unit to start with that, but it got built up as just this big obstacle to overcome mentally before I could even really feel comfortable writing tests on my own. Yeah, I remember before I joined IBM as a full-time hire, I had an internship where I was automating the installation of WebSphere application server on ZOS. And even today, like, still don't know what that means. But (laughs) I essentially had to learn Python and then used that to automate the installation of this application server on, you know, the operating system Z. And I remember having no idea, like, why I was doing it, but I could watch, like, the things happening in the UI of like, oh, a button clicks. And then we go to the next modal. It was like going through a wizard. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. But it seemed very labor intensive. At my last job at LogMeIn, I was doing front end work because I'm a front end engineer now. And we were using just with Enzyme. And actually, I quite liked it. Learning how to mock state was really, really cool. And then now at Spotify, we're using mostly React testing library. I really, really like that. But something I still struggle with to this day is kind of understanding what should be tested because like, correct me if I'm wrong, Angie, but I don't think you need to go for 100% test coverage on every single line, right? Because there are some things that don't need to be tested and I struggle with figuring out what those things are. Yeah, I have a whole talk on this. It's called, which test should I automate? I've come up with essentially this matrix, if you will, That helps you determine this. And you're absolutely right. Going for 100% coverage, one of those things that sounds good in theory, but in practice, uh, not so much, right? What people fail to realize, and I see folks all the time, they'll write their test, but they put so much more care into writing their feature code and just kind of Treat tests as if it's like throwaway code when it's really not. You have to use the same guidelines, the same clean coding, 
practices and things like this. Otherwise, when you really think about what tests are, right, they are guarding your features. They're the source of truth on if this works or does not work. So you can't half-ass this, right? Or like you can break your stuff (laughs) in some pretty severe ways. So trying to cover everything, especially if you're going to do like crappy code, this is something else that you have to maintain in addition to your feature code. Whether you do it well or not, it's still another code base. It's another like software development project. If it's integrated in still, this is code, right? You have to maintain it. And so trying to do everything just gives you a lot more stuff to maintain and a lot of noise. A great indicator is when you have your bill fail because of some tax. And, you know, the team looks at it and like, oh, okay, we don't care. Go ahead and ship it anyway. Just ignore the test. Well, why is that test there, right? That's a great moment to ask yourself. And so I try to move that a little further, a little earlier in the process to say, okay, I want to write this test. If the bill fails because this fails, do I care or not, right? You might not care or you might care, but not enough to stop the bill. So there's various things you can do. In this matrix, I essentially have you evaluate your test for four different things. One is the cost efficiency of writing it, the value that it brings, historical context around it. So is this one of those spaghetti type areas that has a lot of bugs in it? Or is this like running pretty solid and we rarely see any issues here, right? And is it covered by other things, right? Sometimes we have multiple variations, but the heart of it, what we're actually testing is covered. So we don't have to go bananas by adding a million tests with all of these different variations or whatever. So given that, I you kind of give scores to these things and Then I have you like rank them. So not only do you see which has the highest score, meaning I need to automate it, but you have it sorted so you know what I need to automate next kind of vibe. And what are the things that I thought, because I have people do a gut check first. Like, do you think you would automate this? And you end up saying yes to almost everything. And then by the time you get the score, it's like, oh, wow, that's really not worth automating. And I would have thought it was. Definitely. Yeah, it's funny. It's like a pilot on an airplane wouldn't take off without doing like a pre-flight check. So why would you ever publish, you know, software that hasn't been tested? It's funny because I, you've talked about how like, oh, testing isn't necessarily taught in curriculums, which was definitely the case for me. But I think of testing kind of on par with accessibility where like they're always thought as an afterthought. And now like, it seems like more attention is slowly being given to these two areas as like areas of importance, especially we'll talk a little bit later about test-driven development. But yeah, it's like, I guess it's so overwhelming to like, where do you even start learning some of these things? It can be a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I used to be a teacher at a university. So I was an adjunct professor teaching Java programming. I saw for myself, there's not enough room in the semester to include, you know, lessons on testing, especially not in depth. So I tried to kind of integrate that into every lesson, right? For example, if someone, if I give them some exercise to do in class, I'm like, call me over when you're done and I'll go and like break it basically to show them that you have to keep these things in mind. And A lot of people don't have, you know, Angie who's teaching them that sort of thing. So they lack it. And it's one of the reasons why I started Test Automation University. So this is an online platform where all the courses are dedicated to testing and not just JavaScript, all languages. And it's free. All the courses are absolutely free. They're self-paced, video and transcripts. And here's where you can go where you're like, okay, I need to know more about testing or, you know, I need to know how to use a certain testing framework or something like that. 
That's great. And for any of you listening, we are linking all of this in the show notes because it's definitely something you want to check out, especially because it like the fact that it's free is so invaluable. Definitely take advantage of that. Nick, I see you definitely have had some experience with testing. Uh, what is that? Yeah. Well, earlier in my career, I was working on Dojo and with the folks behind Dojo. And so we used for that a tool called the Dojo Object Harness or DO. And it was very memorable because every time your tests would fail, there was actually an option in the, the UI for it where it would have like the Homer Simpson DO that would play every time. <laughs> and that would get really annoying, but it was kind of fun. And then from there, working on Dojo and, and kind of going into Dojo 2 and such, we created a testing framework called Intern that would kind of mix a lot of the more modern testing features that you now come to use in like Mocha and Jest and, and things like that. More of like the, I forget the style of it, but like where you use describes and its rather than just like test and expect, things like that. The behavioral driven maybe is is more of what that's called. Anyway, we created that and some tools on top of that to kind of drive like web driver support, because that's kind of where we were focused is, is browsers specifically and, and running those and really being able to test that the browser is actually doing what we want rather than just, you know, this individualized unit of code is inputs and outputs. And so we have had some test runners that were kind of promise based, but built on top of Selenium web driver. And now those tools are kind of taken over by other more advanced tools like Cypress and even testing library to, to an extent. And, and that was kind of an interesting thing that I have been looking at is kind of how, at least from the front end side, the testing game has changed a little bit to where I'm not really thinking so much about unit tests. And I'm thinking more about like almost integration tests. And it's kind of more the, I guess you would say like the Kent C. Dodds. His name comes to mind when I think of like how that goes. And I think it's because of React Testing Library and the prescription for tests that that kind of provides. What's up, party people? This episode is brought to you by Micro. Micro, aka M3O, is a new cloud platform built for developers by developers. Our good friend Asa Maslam is leading this. And if you're tired of AWS and feeling overwhelmed by the cloud, infinite billing, and an endless sea of docs, it is time for a change. The Micro team is reimagining the cloud for the next generation. M3O is a new developer friendly platform to explore, search, and use simpler APIs for everyday consumption. All in one place. Get access to the APIs you need in one click and test them right there on the web before using them. Simple, fast, and affordable. You won't get burned by bottomless billing. You top up your account and pay as you go. And right now, they're in early development and building out the first set of APIs and they're looking for feedback from developers. Sign up and get $5 in free credits. Kick the tires, give them your input so they can build the best APIs you want to use every single day. Learn more at m3o.com. Again, m3o.com. So let's talk a little bit more about the different types of testing. Nick, before the break, you had mentioned, was it integration testing or regression testing or both? Probably all of the above. Where's the line? That's another yeah. fun question. I know. That, well, there are so many different <laughs> kinds. It's like we've got the ones that I'm aware of, at least, are unit testing, regression testing, integration testing, and end-to-end -end testing. Am I missing mm -hmm. any of the big ones before we dive into them? You have your kind of API testing, mm -hmm. and you also have a nice fancy layer on top of your end-to-end, -end, which is visual testing, mm -hmm. which I specialize in. And this is really cool. I would love to talk about that a little bit at some point if we have time. Absolutely, we do. Yeah, I would love to learn more about that for sure. Yeah. So... End-to-end -end testing is, or um, not end-to-end, let's start with the smallest unit, which is uh, unit testing. So unit testing, are they're meant to test small components, right? So like if you have a modal, for example, you might have like modal.test.whatever. If you're using the, like in, at Spotify, when I do like web uh, components, we always have like a test TypeScript file for every component. 
And these are kind of meant like if it's a modal to see whether or not it actually renders properly if, if something, you know, if it's supposed to be visible or if the text is correct and things like that. Are there any misconceptions about unit testing? Because I feel like this is one area where people can get really minute into details. And maybe this is where they should refer to your matrix, Angie, because like I struggle here to be like, okay, do I really need to test a component actually renders? It's funny, like looking through our code base, I'm like, it renders. And it's like, why is that always the first test? Do we really need to test that it's rendering? I don't know. <laughs> Usually that's the one I set up just to make sure that I actually have the test runner set yeah. up properly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll take that away from people or they won't ever get started. Like they, they need that one test just, you know, to kind of feel confident. It's funny because like I'll be writing a test and I'm like, okay, there's definitely something wrong with it. Like it should break and then it passes and I'm like, did I do something wrong or am I just smart? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think, you know, that's maybe why test-driven development is good. And again, we'll talk about that in, in a little bit, but it is always good to see your test go from failing to successful. And unit testing is kind of at least for me personally, unit testing was the most comprehensible type of testing for me because it allowed me to focus on one small piece of the UI as opposed to like an entire user flow. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It's very narrow. You can kind of, because when you're trying to test something bigger, that's where a lot of confusion comes in and you start going down a rabbit hole. So I really like for a unit test, you know, it's kind of like, what's the smallest thing that you can target here? And let's get away from any other like dependencies and things like that. So it's not a whole lot of setup and all of that. Very, very focused. And if one of those fail, you know exactly what's wrong. So I really love those. Would you say from like a front end testing perspective that the smallest unit you could test is like a full component itself? Or would you dig deeper in? Depending on what you call a component, mm -hmm. right? So if the component is includes like a field and a button, then those are two different units in my opinion. Mm. So I could exercise that field with quite a few tests. I could also execute that button and it depending on if it's supposed to have various states, you know, like disabled or whatever, I could exercise each one of the, so I would say unit testing at like, at the front end level would be down to the individual elements. And then in my opinion, the integration of that is the component if there's multiple pieces, right? Yeah. And some widgets like a date picker, for example, I might consider that like one thing. So my unit test would be there versus, you know, oh, the selection of a certain date or the arrows back and forth. Like I wouldn't want to get that granular. It's like Emma said, like, you know, it varies. And then you start getting confused. Like, all right, where do I start? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's just my perspective, but like the front end always adds like an extra layer of confusion to it too, because I always feel like I'm walking this fine line between writing good, like smallest unit possible tests for whatever I'm trying to test, but also trying not to get too into the weeds of like the implementation details of that component. And I think kind of what you mentioned, Angie, with like, you know, testing like disabled state or maybe like testing whether specific roles get set. I kind of like that idea because then it like at least lets me kind of hook into things that I would really want to see in the actual product as opposed to like, oh, you know, this div now is positioned over here or, or whatever things that are like too implementation specific, but not really providing me a ton of value. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what you just mentioned can be solved by visual regression testing or visual testing in general. And we'll let Angie tell us more about that. Yeah. Actually, let's just cover it now because it fits into this conversation. Angie, can you tell us a little bit more about visual testing? Yeah, so it works whether you want to do like kind of unit testing or if you want to do, you know, more of an end-to-end -end type testing. Let me tell you what it is first off. So visual testing is where it takes a picture of your application in, you know, its desired state. It saves that as a baseline. So when you're first writing that test, right, you know how you look at it as a human being and you're like, yeah, that looks good. All right, boom, that's your baseline. 
And so then when you run your regression test, it'll take another screenshot and it'll compare those two screenshots together to determine if there are any differences there, right? So that's visual testing. Now you can run this at like the component level. So say you have, you know, storybook library with all of your components, you can run that visual test against, and I consider that like the unit test of front end testing. You can run this against like all of the various components to make sure in isolation, they all look like they're supposed to look, right? You don't want to just leave it there because we've all seen where things start overlapping or different viewport sizes, they're bleeding off the edge of the page and stuff like that. So that's where you would test like your full page. Now, I want to say like, so your front end, there's so many things that can go wrong that if you don't do this whole visual piece, I often question like, why are you even testing the front end at all? So the front end, when you are at that level, you're testing not just the functionality, because you could have tested that at a lower level, right? You're also testing the display of stuff. That's what the browser is for, right? To display, accept the input, present some output. So you have to verify that presentation. Otherwise, why are you even on the browser? And unfortunately, a lot of the testing tools, they're amazing, but they all work with the DOM right? If you ask them, is this text present on the screen? They're not looking on the screen. They're looking on the DOM to see if that text is in the DOM. And it's going to say, yes, it's there. Well, I've seen millions of, not millions, but quite a few cases where the text is maybe same color as the background. So you can't even see it or, you know, it's bleeding off the edge of the page. It's hidden by some other element that's overlapping it. It's upside down. It's whatever. Like there's a million things that can go wrong. And we've all seen these things before, especially when you start changing the viewport sizes, right? And that's the challenging thing about front-end development. You all know this. All of the different browsers, all of the different viewport sizes, you know, breakpoints and stuff like that. So it's a great way to test all of those things without having to write a ton of code to try to do so. Yeah, it's like, I think we forget sometimes that it's not just about does it work from a functional perspective? It's like, does it work visually as well? Like, I mean, well, I develop like a desktop application. So it's not like I can go and like test this on every single browser and every single viewport. And so it's important. We actually have in our pipeline, we actually have our visual regression or integration, you know, snapshots that say like, hey, something's up. Like, you might want to check this out. And we have to make sure before it'll allow us to merge it. This, I'm just thinking of a very specific example of where this kind of testing would have saved me in the past. And I was working on a, a component or like a kind of a composite component that had a lot of different pieces to it. And I ended up adding a very subtle gray background to one piece of that. And I pushed it up and then others on the team were like, hey, why'd you add this <laughs> this background to it? And I'm like, I didn't because looking on my monitor, which was admittedly not the best, it couldn't distinguish that from just like the regular white. And so I'm like staring at it and I'm just like, I cannot see that. But I feel like a, uh, a visual regression would have been able to easily point that out to me. Exactly. Exactly. So I love that. I think visual tests are, are some of my favorites because I do remember like the snapshots that would give you like a DOM printout and be like, your snapshot is not the same. And you would like look at the DOM changes and like have to accept them or reject them. But it was just recently, I think, that I really started noticing the fact that we were doing visual regression tests. And it's only been at Spotify that we've done it. I hadn't done it at IBM and I hadn't done it at Log Me In. But it's so useful, especially like when we think about like design mockups, like sometimes engineers forget that being like pixel perfect does make a big difference. Uh, and they're like, oh, you know, it's just a couple things are off. And like one of my favorite examples is from the book Atomic Habits by Adam Grant when he talks about if you take if a plane takes off from LAX and it wants to land in like New York City and, you know, the pilot decides to turn the headwind just like two degrees in the sky, the passengers aren't even going to notice. It's like a very minute change, but, on, you know, it makes a big impact and they're actually going to land in Washington, D.C., which is not anywhere close to New York City. So these seemingly minute visual regressions can compound and then you have a massive amount of technical debt that needs to be fixed. So 
Very important. When people think about the visual part, they might think, you know, the small cases, right? Like, oh, okay, yeah, text is not like perfectly aligned, big deal or whatever. But, you know, I've seen some visual bugs that literally affect people's bottom lines. Some examples, there was, I was on um, Open Table trying to make a restaurant reservation and like I clicked this uh, modal and the modal popped up. But I saw like two buttons and they weren't in the middle, one. So I didn't know what to do at first. I started looking around and they were in the upper right corner and they weren't aligned, but there was no text there like saying what these buttons were for or anything like this. So immediately I'm thinking like, okay, I'm making a reservation for seven people. I mean, we're going to, we're going to like ball out right we're gonna buy drinks we're gonna buy food and I was thinking like how much business is lost because I can't even complete like this reservation right another one was on Instagram where it was a sponsored post but all of the text was overlapped on each other and kind of jumbled so you couldn't read it there was no picture there it was awful and I'm thinking like someone paid to have their content shown like this, which means they're going to ask Instagram for a refund and, you know, probably not trust that product for their marketing needs anymore, right? So these are very real consequences to these visual bugs. It's not just a, oh, well, kind of thing or, you know, small, minute stuff. It's it's definitely worth um, looking into as part of your strategy. That's so true. It's like once we add dollar signs to things, then people start taking it seriously. It's like Mm -hmm. accessibility as well was one area where it's like no one wanted to invest. And then, you know, especially the EU got hit really hard with new regulations. And then we started seeing like lawsuits coming out about inaccessible websites and people getting sued and It's like, well, testing, I don't know if you can necessarily get sued for that directly, but it is a result of a lack of testing that these regressions or incorrect integrations are happening. And especially like what Angie said, if you're working with sponsorships, your reputation and your income are on the line there. (laughs) Yep, exactly. And visual testing can, like if we think outside of the box, it can help with even stuff like accessibility testing, right? So my company, Applitools, that's one of the features that's available in the visual testing is, okay, now I have these two pictures of your application and I'm comparing, you're good to go, but did you know, like, you know, uh, you're not following accessibility guidelines because there's not enough contrast between like this text and its background. So, you know, that's really helpful information you might want to know before shipping this out. Absolutely, it is. Let's talk a little bit about regression testing because we actually run manual regression tests every two weeks. We're on two-week sprint cycles. And at the end of every cycle, when we're about to release, all of the squads get together with this huge spreadsheet and manually regression test things. So regression tests are basically tests that ensure that anything you've committed to be published is not going to break anything that already was performing well. So my question for you, Angie, is like we have all these different types of tests. I'm confusing now regression and integration because they're very similar, but integration is a little bit different. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like... Regression tests are any of your kind of tests. Your unit tests are regression, your integration. Regression just means I run these over and over. Like this is not new functionality, not new tests. I'm just running it again on our old stuff. That's your regression. I learned something new today. I don't know. I'm excited about that. Okay. (laughs) Fabulous. It only took me how many years of professional software development. But integration testing is ensuring that like when you have something new, it integrates cohesively with what exists currently. Is that true? Yeah. Making sure like different components are integrated successfully. Yeah. I was just going to ask with integration testing, with integration, would you also have like portions of it mocked out or where does mocking come in in your in your uh, thoughts yeah so you're mocking i like to mock things that are like one if i'm doing some integration with like a third party system i don't want to test their stuff i like i barely can test my stuff i don't have time to test their stuff too right so let's say you had i don't know some integration with like mm, twitter or something like that You don't want to be on the Twitter app and all of that. So you would kind of mock maybe your API request to Twitter or something like that. 
and just essentially focus on your application versus the other part of that. Other ways people mock is if you have like kind of these various development teams that they may work together, but you're working on your piece, Emma. Nick, you're working on your piece. I'm working on my piece. Well, I want to test my piece, but I'm waiting on you. So I don't want to wait on you. I'm going to mock your piece out and test my piece. And I'm going to mock Emma's piece and test my piece just to make sure I'm holding up my end of the contract. You probably are going to mock my piece and whatever, but that can't be your end solution, right? So you do that for your kind of, I did my due diligence, you did yours, you did yours. Somebody needs to actually integrate these together to make sure that they work in real life. So you would then have some additional integration tests that maybe actually put us together and exercise some scenarios. Hmm. So like mocking definitely confused me when I started out and I'm going to spew out an analogy and tell me if this is correct. So like if we're building out, let's say a buddy feature, whether this is, you know, let's say the Facebook like buddy feature where you can see who's online and like chat with people. Let's say that you're testing like the actual components that render whether someone's online. It's like you don't care necessarily about the API request that's being sent to like grab all of your friend information. You just care about like, given the response that you get back, a list of friends, is it rendering properly? That's kind of what a mock does, right? It's just giving you this mock data or fake data. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Awesome. And Nick, you had mentioned end-to-end testing, and this is the biggest umbrella of test or biggest type of testing, correct? Because you're actually like going through user flows or am I mistaken? That's going to be like your most complex one to write. Mm -hmm. And the longest to run and the hardest to maintain. So you try to have very few of those. I wouldn't at all recommend making this like the heart of your test suite, right? I believe you should have mostly unit tests, you know, some integration tests and a couple of very critical end-to-end flows. There's nothing more painful than having flaky end-to-end tests because I've had this issue where it's like, I have to re-trigger builds over and over, not because my code is messing anything up, but just because like the pipeline is so inundated and just they break. I just wanted to take a moment to define that for anyone who's listening might not know, like what are they even talking about with end-to-end? So that's where you take like a scenario, like a real scenario. So you're not just making sure that you could select a date, but maybe you're selecting a date as part of a longer form. For example booking a flight, right? So you would take that from the beginning. So you come to the application, maybe you log in, you search for flights, you choose one, you select the one you want, you go through the payments, and now it's complete. So you take like a customer journey where there's some goal that needs to be met and you go through all the steps to make sure that works. Now, when you're doing your end-to-end testing, I do recommend like, all right, go ahead and do all of that on the UI. But when you're testing like a certain piece, like maybe I want to just test checkout. I don't want to write an end-to-end flow just to test checkout. So that's when you start kind of using like what I call code scenes. So is there a way that I maybe can make an API call or something to essentially get my app into the testable state? that I want to test, right? And I feel like that's where people go wrong with front-end testing is you're doing too much on the front-end. And that's why our tests become long and and flaky and fragile because you just have too much going on here, right? I don't want to search for flights when I'm trying to test payment of flights, right? So let's just maybe make an API call where we add this thing to the cart or something like that. And then I can just go to the UI, make sure that looks right, do the payment, boom, I'm done. That's really yeah. great. I love that because like, I always think about like, yeah, and to end us as a scenario, I think that's a really great way to put it. Cause I just thought like, oh, it's just testing an entire user flow. It's like, no, like you, like you said, you don't care about like searching through an entire list of flights. You care if like the checkout works. Cause that's where your business could fail and, or like making a reservation. Right. That's awesome. Nick, what were you going to say? I forgot, but I do have another question. (laughs) So with this, so like when we were talking about integration testing, we were, and mocking, we were kind of talking about how, you know, you have 
given this set of inputs, I can mock that out and say, you know, this API will always return me this. So is, is this where you would create that scene or scenario to actually verify that, yeah, they're still sending me the same shape of data yeah. and kind of put it together here? Yeah, you got to do that part. You know, mocking has its place, but that cannot be like your end all strategy. Otherwise, yeah, that API changed and you had no idea because you were still just using the mocked response. And, um, you know, that's when stuff starts falling apart. Yeah. I feel like this is a good place to say things like interfaces that TypeScript can give you are like a good way to you know, no, if this API or this third party tool that I'm using gives me an interface that shows me what they're using and I'm coding against that, maybe I can catch it earlier by noticing that I no longer match the data that's coming back. That's overall a good thing. But yeah, the other thing I was going to say is in my experience with end-to-end testing, like this is always the one that I kind of fear the most. And it's because they're the most complex with the most number of like small pieces that can go wrong. They just totally break it and they take the longest. So they're, they end up getting run less frequently. What up, party people? If you want to know what's happening with your code, track errors, and monitor your performance with Sentry, build better software faster with Sentry's application monitoring platform, diagnose, fix, and optimize the performance of your code, cut your time on error resolution from hours to minutes, it works with any language, and integrates with dozens of services. Over 1 million developers and 68,000 organizations already use Sentry. And best of all, GS Party listeners new to Sentry get the team plan for free for three months. Head to Sentry.io to get started and use the code PARTYTIME when you sign up. Again, Sentry.io and use the code PARTYTIME because, hey, it's party time, y'all. So we've talked about quite a few different types of testing, but one concept or paradigm that is gaining popularity is test-driven development. Angie, can you tell us a little bit more about what test-driven development is? Yeah, so this is one of those things that people like love it or they hate it. There's very much so like, ah, oh, TDD or BUS type of folks. <laughs> I'm not one of those type of people, although I think it is a fantastic technique. But you're okay if you don't go that route. So what it is, is where you write your test first. And this essentially drives the design and the development of your feature. So let's say, for example, you needed to write a login form. You need to write like some component, a login form, right? So you would first write your test that says whatever. You know, it enters a username, it enters a password and it clicks the button and it should then navigate to the home page or something like that, right? So that might be your test. You write that test out and then you would develop just enough code to make that test work, right? And usually TDD is, I haven't seen many people do it on front end tests. I see them mostly do it on like, you know, back end very small, like unit test type of thing. But you could definitely do it on front end like the scenario I just gave. But the idea here is you don't get to write code unless you have a test that is dictating that I need this code in order to pass. So your tests always start out as red because you don't have the code yet. And you write only enough code to get that test to pass. So this helps you with staying focused, not over-engineering the problem, and also making sure you get some regression tests at the end of all of that. So you keep going down this cycle. So you write enough for that scenario, and then you think, okay, well, what about if they enter the wrong password? All right, well, that's another test you then write. What should happen? 
Okay, I'm expecting this error. All right, now I get to go write the code that makes that test pass, makes that possible. And you continue this cycle until you feel like you've developed the feature, you've covered all of your bases. I can't tell you how many times that would have saved my ass because my team in particular, we build like these really new high priority features in the desktop app. And when we have millions of monthly active users, it's really important that we don't over-engineer our code and that we don't forget things. And it can definitely be maybe not as exciting for some people to jump in and do tests first. A lot of engineers want to just get straight into the problem. And that used to be kind of how I thought about it as well, and sometimes still do. But to Andy's point, like, you shouldn't necessarily be writing any additional code than what you need to solve all of these design problems would have saved my ass so many times. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we realize like a lot of assumptions and stuff that we make as well. So when you start with this approach first, <laughs> I find myself sometimes like jumping ahead of the gun, meaning I implemented too much and you find yourself doing that a lot. So like even in that one case where I said, okay, you need to log in. So when you go in, you're supposed to write like the very smallest, most minimal thing you can do to make that pass. Say if my login is Angie and my password is Jones, then I'm supposed to like literally kind of hard code that into that because that makes that test pass. And you only get to write more as you come up with more scenarios. Like it's a different uh, username and password. Or, you know, it's the wrong one. And that's when you start adding your conditionals and stuff like that. But we have a really bad habit of jumping right to, okay, if it's this, then that. It's like, no, no, no. (laughs) Take a step back. (laughs) Only the most minimal amount of code to get that particular test to pass. So let me ask about that scenario then. Like breaking it down to just like the first step. I'm thinking from like a a front end test, right? So log in, username and password, and then hit the button. To do any of that, the first thing I have to do probably is find the username input. And so when I don't have any code written for that component yet, how would you even start that off? Would you Ooh, just I like- love I love that question. <laughs> this is why I love that question. Let me tell you, front end folks, we have a very, very bad habit of not putting unique identifiers on our elements, right? And this makes your code really hard to test. It makes it really hard to automate because to automate this, you need to be able to get to that specific element. And I, yeah, I can use like some CSS selectors and stuff, but you want this stuff to be as unique as possible. I don't want to say, find me the button. And then when we add another button, it's like, oh, well, maybe find me the first button. And then we put another <laughs> button later on as a but. Oh, now it's not the first. And you see where I'm going with this? So if you Absolutely. have an ID on there that says login button, <laughs> then in my test, I can say, okay, find the thing that has ID, login button, click it, find this, da, 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 da. That forces me to then, when I implement those elements, I have to put those buttons in order to make the test pass. One thing that I've kind of seen recently, I can't remember where I saw it, but it was taking that exact same scenario where you have something unique like that. But instead of being like, you know, an idea of button, it was maybe like a role or some kind of accessibility mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. on there so that you're searching by that. But you're also enforcing that you actually have the accessibility requirements that you need. I like I, it. I love that. Yes, absolutely. So. If someone is building out a React application from scratch and they want to create some tests, let's say unit tests, what type of technology should they be looking at for their project? You mean like testing tools? Yeah, like tools. Like, because there are quite a few that you could use. Like, how would you know which to choose over another? Yeah, it's starting to get kind of like these frameworks out here, (laughs) these front end frameworks where you. Now I have so many, it's like, which one do I choose? I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind. For the most part, all of them kind of work the same where they're querying the DOM, allowing you to interact with some elements and, you know, reading from the DOM to give you some information back. So all of them kind of have that in common. There are some of them that offer like more kind of code lists or low code type 
approaches as well. For example, Cypress has a recorder, Selenium web driver. They also have Selenium IDE version, stuff like that. So if you maybe want, I don't know, your manual testers to write some front end tests, maybe that's an option for you. There's some drawbacks and limitations with that sort of approach. But if you know you have dedicated test automation folks or your devs are going to write some tests, then you know you might want to go with one of the coded solutions. And with that too, you start thinking, okay, what do I have to cover? Is this you know, something I need to cover on various browsers, on, you know, various devices even. Like, you know, I want to make sure it works as a web app on my mobile phone too, you know, stuff like that. So making sure like those capabilities are there as well. I also like to make sure there's some support. So with so many of these new ones popping up all the time, it's really tempting to kind of chase (laughs) what's new and hot. But I've learned the hard way, like I've had to tell, you know, my development teams, like, no, that like literally came out last week. There's no documentation. There's no support. If we run into any kind of issue, there's no one we can call, you know, not only that, like sometimes people are doing this stuff as a hackathon or, you know, like a fun side project and then they go off and do something else with their lives. And so you don't even have, you know, anyone maintaining this. So that's definitely something to consider as well. Like what's the community around this? Is it something that's trusted? Is there, you know, are there people you can bounce ideas off of, go to if you have questions? Is it open source where we can contribute if we need to? If it's not, if it's a vendor, what do they have over the open source options that would make it worthwhile? That's really great advice. Yeah, absolutely. And Nick, do you have any other questions before I ask Angie one last one? So you mentioned at the beginning that you do a lot of like consulting, coming into companies and like setting up test automation. So I was just going to ask kind of like a personal question. And that's, I know it would be like set up specifically to the problem you're trying to solve, but given free range, what's your ideal testing stack? Mm. Y'all not gonna like this because I'm on a JS party, but I'm a Java girl. Uh, <laughs> Java is my fave. So I like that. I love Selenium Web Driver. For JavaScript, I really like Cypress. So I work with that when I need to work with JS teams. I'm gonna put my visual testing in all of those stacks because if I'm gonna do front end testing, It just makes sense to test the appearance of it, right? I like Mocha. I like Chai. I like, in the Java world, JUnit, API type of stuff. So there's like Super Test and Nook in the, is it Nook or Nook? Emma, get us the thing with the link. I will. (laughs) Um, But you use that for like your API testing. I really like that. In the Java world, I like uh, Rest Assured for API testing. Yeah, cucumber in in different scenarios. So there's also like BDD. Um, we didn't even yeah. touch on that. That's a whole nother like beast and click. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. How about you, Nick? What do you like? Oh, uh, I rarely get to choose, but yeah, I've really been liking kind of the mentality that testing library has kind of forced me to think. Sorry, in, in I terms forgot of about like, testing library. I like that too. Yeah, I'm approaching more from a front end side, for sure. That's kind of where I spend most of my days. But I really like the idea of like, I'm not writing tests to test the code, like the inputs and outputs of the code. I'm really writing tests to verify that given user input in this way, the user sees something in this way. Mm -hmm. And testing library is a good introduction to that. And I'm kind of curious if like, I could just go further easier with something like Cypress to like give me more control over that because a lot of times with testing library, you know, it's writing out a lot of code, it's running in JS DOM and it's always just checking the DOM and I'm kind of having to guess as to whether I'm actually doing things correctly. Whereas with something like Cypress, I can run the Cypress like visual browser and watch it run the test in front of me and Mm -hmm. I can see, oh wait, I'm not clicking the right button right there (laughs) and then adjust the test correctly. Yeah. Cypress allows you to backtrack in time too, like to different snapshots, right? Or am I thinking of something else? Yeah. When you run it, it'll run through each step. And then when it's done, like you can say, 
click on when I entered my password and it'll show you like what was going on when you enter your password and all of that. So yeah, it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. Yeah. So my question for you, Angie, is for someone interested in getting started with testing, what's like the biggest piece of advice that you wish that you had when you were starting out? Great question. It's more than just tech, right? And that's like the answer for a lot of things in this industry. You have to have, you know, a culture that embraces this type of mindset. Otherwise, you're kind of off doing your own little side project and you have no support. No one else is contributing. No one cares. And it kind of just gets abandoned and it's a big flop. I've seen that lots of times. You have like an eager kind of person that's like, oh, we should test the things and I'm going to start us up our test um, framework and I'm going to bring in Cypher. I'm going to do blah, 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 blah. And your bills are failing because you integrated them because no one else is contributing or cares and they're breaking stuff. And then it's like, cut those stupid tests off. We got features to ship. And then it just kind of gets abandoned. So I would focus on why you want to do it and what's the goal you expect here? One of the most common goals is fast feedback, right? We want to be able to make sure our application hasn't regressed and we want that information very quickly. So with that goal in mind, all of your actions should follow that, right? The, the tools you choose, how you write your test, what you even test, all of that stuff, you know, you have that goal in mind and you make sure that the team is aware of this and they're on board with it, right? So there may need to be some kind of, you know, lunch learning sessions or something for the whole team where we understand the risk, the value add that testing brings and kind of get everybody on board. And then we move into how to implement this. That was wonderful advice. I wish I had like learned about testing when I was starting out. Although to be honest, I feel like I would have been overwhelmed because at the time I didn't even know web development, but I was in a web development position. <laughs> so <laughs> it just probably would have been a lot. But if y'all are interested in learning more about testing, I'm going to link all of Angie's information down below, including the Test Automation University link, which you should absolutely go check out. I want to extend a huge thank you to you, Angie, for joining us today and, and sharing your knowledge. I learned a lot. I learned that regression tests is just an essentially umbrella for you know many different types of testing. And we're also going to link Angie's talk about how to know like which tests should be automated in the show notes. So highly recommend checking that out. I cannot wait to go watch that. So thank you once again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a nice day, y'all. Okay, bye-bye. Survey says we are gearing up for our next Front End Feud episode, and we need your help. Fill out the survey at jsparty.fm slash ff, and you could win a free JS Party t-shirt. Once again, that's jsparty.fm slash ff, like Front End Feud. JS Party is produced by Jared Santo with music by The Beat Freak, Breakmaster Cylinder. We are brought to you by Fastly, Launch Darkly, and Linode. Next up on the pod, Nick Reese joins Amel, K-Ball, and myself to talk about Elder JS, a static site generator for Svelte. That one will be hitting your podcast feed next week. Do you want to start a YouTube channel together called JavaScript? Yeah.